Welcome back. Let's get started on video 27.4, Opportunistic Fungal Infections. We will be talking about two molds and one yeast. The fungi that cause all three of these entities are relatively ubiquitous in the environment, but they only cause disease in immunocompromised individuals. Cam the Contractor is a 59-year-old man who six months ago was diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia. After receiving his first two rounds of chemo, he was getting a little bored of staying at home, and he decided he really missed all the other contractors at work. So he stopped by the new construction site to say hello to all the guys. And after traipsing around the foundation of a new building, developed a persistent cough. He mentioned it to his doctor, who was concerned and thought it might be a good idea to get some imaging. Aspergillosis describes infection from the genus Aspergillus. Multiple Aspergillus species cause disease, but Aspergillus fumigatus is the most important. The epidemiology and clinical progression of the species types vary slightly, but since all respond to the same first-line treatment, it is less important to memorize individual Aspergillus species names. The hyphae of Aspergillus are hyaline, narrow, septate structures that branch at 45 degree angles. We will be talking about three categories of aspergillosis, invasive, chronic, and allergic. Invasive disease may be pulmonary, may involve the facial sinuses, or may be more widely disseminated. Chronic aspergillosis progresses insidiously in the lungs, the sinuses, or as a more static, non-progressive entity known as an aspergilloma. Allergic aspergillosis is not truly an infection, but rather a hypersensitivity response to inhaled aspergillus canidia. Aspergillus has a worldwide distribution. The mold produce vast numbers of terminal aerosolizable canidia, and most individuals have exposures of several millions of canidia per day. And the vast majority of disease occurs in the immunocompromised. The primary risk factor is profound neutropenia or poor PMN function. Long-term glucocorticoid use is also a risk factor. Existing pulmonary parenchymal disease is a risk factor for developing chronic aspergillosis. Allergic syndromes are associated with genetic polymorphisms in interleukins or with heterozygosity of the CFTR gene of cystic fibrosis. Once the canidia reach the alveoli, they adhere to fibrinogen and laminin and are capable of producing extracellular proteases to further facilitate invasion. Macrophages are the first line of defense. Antibodies form, but their protective value is not well understood. First, let's talk about invasive aspergillosis. Invasive pulmonary aspergillosis is arbitrarily divided into acute and subacute forms. The presentation may range from asymptomatic to feverish with cough, hemoptysis, and dyspnea. Disease severity parallels the extent of immunocompromise. Our friend Cam the contractor would have had a CT that looked like this. In addition to the pulmonary nodules, there's visualization of a halo sign, which is a circular ground glass appearing rim representing hemorrhagic infarction surrounding the hypertense nodule. Five to 10% of pulmonary aspergillosis also involve the sinuses. Endoscopic examination like this would reveal pale or necrotic tissue. Occasionally, the tracheobronchial passages are also affected. The most severe form of invasive aspergillosis is disseminated disease. The most common extrapulmonary involvement is CNS, but it may infect any organ system. A mild sepsis picture occurs over one to three days, often followed by precipitous deterioration. CNS disease results in these hemorrhagic lesions that have a tendency to form abscesses. Endocarditis may form on prosthetic or damaged valves, and superficial aspergillosis may result in necrotic cutaneous lesions, keratitis, or otitis externa. That covers invasive aspergillosis. Now let's talk about chronic disease. Chronic cavitary pulmonary aspergillosis occurs in patients with pre-existing lung disease. The aspergillus slowly grow in pulmonary cavities, producing constitutional and pulmonic symptoms that mimic tuberculosis. Cavities contain fluid levels or well-formed fungal balls called aspergillomas. 
long-standing pulmonary disease may result in fibrosis of the upper lobes. Just as was the case with acute invasive disease of the lungs, chronic pulmonary aspergillosis may have sinus involvement, resulting in headaches, loss of sense of smell, vision changes, or more serious sequela. Aspergillomas may reside in residual cavities in the lungs or in the facial sinuses without progressive parenchymal involvement. These fungal balls reside in cavities that are usually larger than 2.5 centimeters, and they may present asymptomatically with a cough, hemoptysis, wheezing, or mild fatigue. That covers chronic aspergillosis. Now let's talk about allergic aspergillosis. Allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis is a hypersensitivity reaction more common in patients with asthma or that are carriers for cystic fibrosis. It causes episodes of bronchial obstruction with coughing fits and makes patients more susceptible to recurrent pneumonias. Allergic disease may also affect the sinuses. Invasive aspergillosis presents with a heavy fungal load and so histopathology of the involved tissue usually confirms the diagnosis and is considered the gold standard. The narrow hyphae branching at 45 degree angles are seen invading blood vessels and leading to necrosis with limited inflammation. Culture is much less reliable. The aspergillus antigen test relies on detecting galactomannan, but the sensitivity of this test is reduced by antifungal usage, and there may be false positives in patients receiving certain antibiotics. Galactomannan is useful in chronic disease, where high titers and elevated IgE levels are sufficient to make a diagnosis. Lung involvement may also be diagnosed via CT, particularly with visualization of a halo sign, though other nonspecific lung findings are also common. Because of the rapid progression of decline associated with disseminated disease, up to 40% of cases of invasive disseminated aspergillosis are diagnosed at autopsy. So what are we going to do for our friend, Cam the Contractor? First-line treatment for invasive aspergillosis is voriconazole. After receiving his voriconazole, Cam fully recovered and is now the lead contractor on a building in New York City. Maybe you've heard of it. Attack of the Mucor the sugar-seeking, acid-loving, iron-eating fungus that literally erodes through your face. It sounds like a laughably bad, scary movie, but as any infectious disease doctor will tell you, mucormycosis is no laughing matter. Mucormycosis is a life-threatening infection caused by fungus in the order mucoralis. It is an invasive and relentless progressive disease that requires a high index of suspicion and early initiation of therapy to optimize outcomes. Mucor are thick-walled, ribbon-like, aseptate hyphal elements branching at right angles. They may cause cutaneous infections in immunocompetent individuals, but for our purposes, we will be focusing on invasive mucormycosis, affecting individuals with some alteration of normal immunologic function. There are four major risk factors to developing invasive mucormycosis. The first is defects in neutrophil function. The second is elevated serum iron levels. The third is acidosis as an increase in hydrogen ion concentration in the bloodstream competitively dissociates iron from sequestering proteins in the serum, raising iron levels. The fourth is hyperglycemia, as hyperglycemia has a negative effect on phagocyte function. Invasive mucor occurs in the patients with the risk factors we discussed, but also in patients on prophylaxis who appear to be at increased risk for breakthrough mucormycosis. The most common form of invasive mucormycosis is rhinocerebral. These patients present with eye or facial pain, followed by numbness and soft tissue swelling. They may or may not be febrile. 
The mucor can spread from the maxillary sinus into the mouth or from the ethmoid sinus into the orbit, which would compromise extraocular muscle function. External exam may reveal erythema or edema, and later stages are marked by eschar formation. In the case of ocular involvement, if the contralateral eye becomes involved as well, that suggests cavernous sinus involvement, and that carries a very grim prognosis. Pulmonary mucor is the second most common invasive mucor mycosis. Symptoms include cough, dyspnea, and chest pain, but as angioinvasion progresses, necrosis and deep cavitation of lung parenchyma may result in severe hemoptysis. Radiography will reveal lobar consolidation or wedge-shaped infarcts. When distinguishing mucor from aspergillosis, the presence of more than 10 nodules makes mucor mycosis more likely than aspergillosis. Gastrointestinal mucor occurs mostly in premature neonates. Dissemination most commonly goes to the brain, but any organ may be involved. It carries a very grim prognosis. Cutaneous mucor in immunocompetent individuals is the result of traumatic implantation of soil into the subcutaneous tissue. From there, mucor may penetrate the muscle, fascia, or even bone. Prompt surgical debridement is necessary, an early treatment has a favorable prognosis. But if the patient develops necrotizing fasciitis, he or she has upwards of an 80% mortality rate. As we mentioned, a high index of suspicion is required to diagnose invasive mucormycosis, and up to half the cases are diagnosed post-mortem. Histopathology remains the most sensitive and specific modality for diagnosis, with the non-septate, thick right-angled molds easily visualized. Culture aids in diagnosis, but given the urgency of therapy, histopathology is preferable. CT or MRI aids diagnosis, but also helps develop prognoses for patients. Because mucor causes thrombosis of arteries and necrosis of tissue, antifungals have poor penetration into the sites of infection, making surgical debridement necessary. The steps to treatment include early diagnosis, reversal of risk factors, surgical debridement, prompt therapy with amphotericin B, and routine follow-up with radiographic imaging to ensure no disease progression postoperatively. Myrtle Smith is a lovely woman of 78 years from Staten Island, New York. She received a renal transplant about six months ago for diabetic nephropathy. Over the last one to two months, she has noticed it's harder to remember things. She gets headaches, has neck stiffness, and sometimes gets fevers. When the doctor takes a little more history, he finds out that she might be the victim of one of the biggest bioterrorist groups in New York City. Pigeons. Every morning she feeds these foul fowl, and they have thanked her with a whopping case of cryptococcal meningitis. Beware. The evil pigeons. Cryptococcosis is caused by a genus of yeast containing two species, Neoformans and Gadii. The yeast have large capsules that exclude ink, making them very recognizable. Cryptococcus cause pulmonary, CNS, and disseminated disease entities. Cryptococcosis occurs almost exclusively in individuals with impaired immunity. AIDS patients make up the overwhelming majority of cases. During the AIDS epidemic of the 1980s and 90s in New York City, cases of cryptococcal meningitis far outnumbered all cases of bacterial meningitis combined. Worldwide, particularly in regions where antiretroviral therapy is not readily available, roughly one-third of the AIDS population have cryptococcal meningitis, and perhaps as many as one million cases with 600,000 deaths occur annually. Cryptococcus neoformans is found in soil contaminated with avian excreta, especially pigeons. Notably, Cryptococcus gadii is not found in the soil, but instead inhabits certain tree species. Gadii also notably causes disease in immunocompetent patients and is now commonly encountered in the Pacific Northwest, sometimes in outbreaks. We will focus all of our energy, however, on Decrypticoccus neoformans.
The model of pathogenesis is poorly understood. The yeast enter the lung, where it seems pulmonary defense mechanisms of individuals with intact immune systems are highly effective at clearing the fungus. Th1 responses are important in clearing any surviving yeast. The yeast have large antiphagocytic capsules. They also convert catecholamines into melanin, which appears to play a role in dampening the body's inflammatory response towards the yeast. It is unclear how dissemination occurs, but it's thought that yeast enter the CNS inside macrophages. CNS involvement in cryptococcosis presents as a chronic meningitis picture. Indolent cases may present as subacute dementia over months to years. The presentations of pulmonary cryptococcosis range from asymptomatic cases discovered incidentally from radiographs to much more active presentations with painful cough and sputum. Disseminated disease commonly presents with multi-organ dysfunction and skin lesions that can be highly variable. The course of cryptococcosis may be accelerated with greater immunodeficiency. The gold standard of diagnosis is direct visualization of yeast cells, distinctive for those large capsules. The yeast are easier to identify with special Indian ink stains that raise the sensitivity of CSF examination from 20 to perhaps as high as 50 percent. CSF studies will often reveal mononuclear pleocytosis with increased protein and increased opening pressures. Cryptococcal cultures are near 100 percent sensitive for cases of CNS cryptococcosis and have relatively good sensitivities for detecting pulmonary cryptococcosis but these are not always time sensitive. Cryptococcal antigen tests detecting a capsular polysaccharide are both sensitive and specific in the blood and the CSF. Imaging may be useful in supporting a diagnosis of cryptococcosis, but it will not help differentiate one meningitis or pulmonary disease etiology from another. Pulmonary crypto is treated with fluconazole, especially in less severe cases. More severe cases require amphotericin B before switching to fluconazole. With CNS involvement, the initial regimen is amphotericin B plus the chemotherapeutic agent flucytosine. That's it for the opportunistic fungal infections. See you next time.